Hello, everyone, and greetings. I am really excited to welcome you this evening to the Primary Source Online Seminar on Sports and the Right to Play, a Global Human Rights Issue. Our session tonight features researcher, innovator, activist, and athlete, Eli A. Wolf. And welcome, Eli. We are so very glad to have you with us this evening. It's um, great that you could join us tonight. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Eli. I'm Susan Zeiger. I'm a program director at Primary Source, and I'll be introducing Eli more formally to you in just a few moments. But let me say first that the webinar this evening is part of a three-part series this spring on ways to engage young people, primarily those in the United States, in thinking about global campaigns for justice around the world and in their own country. This is our kickoff event for the series this spring. And maybe that was an intentional pun, Eli being a soccer player. Um, we will be following this evening's um, session up coming up on Wednesday, February 15th with teaching the UN Sustainable Development Goals. That's a really core topic for global education across the curriculum and the grade spectrum. And it's an area of expertise for Primary Sources Own Program Director, Anne-Marie Gleason, um, who will be featured that evening. And then we close out the year with an examination of campaigns to abolish modern day slavery. More to be posted on that session soon. So please stay tuned for all of those. This is actually our second year of this global social action um, series for educators. Last year's series, we examined children's human rights around the world, transnational perspectives on violence against women, and the global climate action movement. And if you're sad because you missed those wonderful sessions, you can find each of them as a recording on our YouTube channel. And I'll be saying more about that later tonight. So those are all available, as will um, be the other sessions this session and the two to follow. This entire series on social justice issues in global context designed with middle and high school teachers in mind is made possible by a generous, very generous grant from the Cummings Foundation here in the Boston area. So we wanted to thank our sponsors, the Cummings Foundation, very much for the money that made this series possible. And I want as well to welcome and thank all of you who are joining us from many parts of the country. And thank you for making the time to join us for this evening for this se learning session. While I'm doing a round of thank yous, I also want to introduce my colleague, Anne-Marie Gleason, who co-planned the series with me last year and this year. Anne-Marie will be helping to monitor your questions and comments in the chat box and moderate the live Q&A session that we'll have later uh, this evening with Eli. Later in the hour, we'll have, um, as I said, a designated block of time for your questions and comments, but um, we encourage you to begin entering your thoughts as soon as they occur to you in the chat box in the lower left of your computer screen. So you'll see it looks like an a instant messenger box there, or text, uh, you know, text box. You can um, just remember to type into the box and then push enter after you type your comment, and it will be posted for the group to see. We'd really love to know what drew you to the webinar this evening and what threads of this multi-layered issue you'd like to discuss. This is one of our best subscribed webinars in a long time, so we imagine that you bring a lot of curiosity and interest to the table, and we're eager for a discussion later on. Toward the end of the evening, I will have an opportunity to share some high-quality classroom resources that Primary Sources has curated in conjunction with this session. And these are available for anyone who would like to use them. They're gathered together in a free online resource guide, one of our 60-plus topical resource guides for global and multicultural learning in schools. And that brings me to primary source. I'd like to say just a word about our organization as we're getting started tonight. Primary Source is a not-for-profit organization that partners with educators to bring global and cultural, multicultural awareness into K-12 classrooms and schools. We are more than 25 years old. 
the heart of our work is professional development that's carried out in many formats, face-to-face, -face, online, online courses, study tours, book discussion groups, and much more. We are, as well, our resource center for global education um, on online resources and uh, in a face-to-face -face, uh, physical library here in our space if you are in the Boston area. We do um, also curriculum development in school consulting. We welcome you to join us and learn more about our work. And I'll close out this evening by sharing some easy ways for you to do that. And with that, I'd like to turn our attention to our webinar topic this evening and introduce our very special guest speaker. When I first encountered the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child some years ago, I was really struck by the vision that lay behind it. Um, and I hope many of you have had a chance to read it. And if you haven't, I really encourage you to, as it encompasses not just the rights that seem um, so to speak, obvious and obviously vital, like protection from harmful employment for children or military service, um, conscription as soldiers, but also such items as the right to exercise imagination and free thought, and among other things, the right to play. Meeting that really was an aha, aha moment for me. It made me think a little differently about the nature of human rights and even what it means to honor the full dignity of children and other human beings. As it turns out, a community of thinkers and advocates and policymakers around the world have been engaged for some years in an effort to build out that concept of the right to play and make it better known because they don't think it is so well known and more universally accessible. Our speaker tonight is part of that community, and we are privileged to have him with us this evening. And Eli is eager to um, engage with teachers and to, and to bring teachers into this convers important conversation as well. Eli Wolf co-leads the Power of Sport Lab, a platform to fuel and magnify innovation, inclusion, and social change through sport. Eli serves as well as co-director for the Royce Fellowship for Sport and Society at Brown University. From 2003 to 2008, Eli led a global effort to include provisions addressing sport and recreation within the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Eli has also contributed to the International Sport for Development and Social Change community and has assisted with global efforts to create and promote the International Day of Sport for Development and Peace, which is April 6th each year. And you'll hear more about that um, April 6th date and what it signifies a little later this evening from Eli. Eli's career also exemplifies something that we talk about a great deal in global studies, the local to global connection. And I think an example of that is his work as the mentor match coordinator at Partners for Youth with Disabilities, a group that's based here in Boston and works um, in the United States. Finally, um, Eli is an elite athlete himself. Most notably, he was a member of the United States Paralympic soccer teams in the 1996 and 2004 Paralympic Games. Eli is a graduate of Brown University where he played soccer and has an MA in sports studies from the German Sport University of Cologne. So Eli, we are so very excited to learn from you tonight, and we are ready to turn it over to you um, and welcome you to begin your talk. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and it's really uh, wonderful to be here, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm really looking forward to the uh, conversation tonight and sharing some thoughts and reflections about sports and the right to and the right to play, um, and particularly as it's related to that broader context as a human rights issue. Um, so I'm going to be able to go into some things and share some of these different perspectives. I'm particularly going to take an athlete lens, athlete-focused lens. Um, so I have some examples and case studies and, and ways of approaching this conversation about um, athletes and the intersection of sport and the right to play. So I wanted to first start out by kind of introducing this concept and 
and touched on it, um, Susan touched on it in the introduction about how do we think about sport, recreation, and play um, as being uh, vital um, rather than trivial, and how is it essential for fully realizing the human rights promise. And so I think part of that is sort of that shift in our lens and shift towards our way of thinking about as we approach this conversation on, on sport, recreation, and play. Interestingly enough, there's been, a, you know, several international leaders around the world that have, that have really um, helped to articulate what sport means in our world and how it does have an influence and a, and a power. And so Nelson Mandela is um, oftentimes quoted this quote here where he spoke in 2006 at the Laureus um, World Sports Awards, where he kind of profoundly spoke about the fact that sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. Sport can awaken hope where there is previously only despair. And so, again, this notion of sport um, and how do we define that as not only elite sport, but, again, physical activity, play, recreation, the ability to express yourself, to use your body, and how that has a sort of a profound effect in, in how it's constructed and how it can be utilized. Another um, perspective to share um, came from Kofi Annan, um, former Secretary General at the United Nations, who, who really spoke to the fact um, of how does sport bring our world together, you know, that it has this kind of unmatched role in, in uh, connecting people, promoting understanding, healing wounds, mobilizing support, and breaking down barriers. So, again, kind of these global leaders being able to reflect on what sport means and how it, um, how it can be introduced and, and have that profound effect. Within the United Nations system, um, the references to the right to play and the right to sport are evolving and, um, you know, they've been limited over time. There's no kind of one go-to international charter on the right to sport. Um, there is the UNESCO Charter from 1978, which is really one of the earliest references to the right to practice sport and physical education. Um, and then that has recently been updated. So um, last year, there was actually a global working group that um, updated that international UNESCO Charter, so bringing it somewhat up to date, you know, 40 some years later. And um, so that I was able to take part in that process and in some of the new evolutions of, of rights as it relates to, for example, persons with disabilities. Um, you know, women was was in there to some extent early on, but but just being able to update it to the modern time. So the three uh, main international treaties, the CEDA. CRC, which was again touched on earlier, and then recently the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, have um, mentions and references to the right to uh, sport and play. Um, in drafting and being a part of the, the working group for the CRPD, we were able to pass through the sort of the most comprehensive article, Article 30 of the CRPD, CRPD, CRPD addresses um, the right to, to play and the right to sport for persons with disabilities in a variety of contexts, both in uh, mainstream settings and adaptive disability settings. Um, looks at venues, it looks at services, and so we tried to get into more detail where um, CDA and the CRC was a little more broad. So that's within the United Nations system. Again, there's not a lot there, but there's at least something to hang our hat on and at least something to reference. The, the, com, the combination here, which I think is oftentimes very valuable, is this relationship between the United Nations and the International Olympic Committee. Um, the International Olympic Committee has in its charter um, two primary principles, um, principle four and, then, and principle six. Principle four is more specific to the practice of sport is a human right, um, addressing the fact that um, individuals can practice sport without discrimination of any kind, mutual understanding with the spirit of friendship, solidarity, and fair play. So this is in the founding charter, um, 
of, of the Olympic Charter. And so this is um, oftentimes referenced and, and referred to, especially as it relates to this notion of human rights. Another um, principle of um, the Olympic Charter that also speaks to human rights is more focused around um, dis addressing discrimination, and it speaks to specific areas um, of race, color, sex, sexual orientation, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property birth, or other status. These have, this has been developed over the years, adding um, different dimensions. I'll speak a little bit later about sexual orientation. That was recently added in 2014 after a campaign by um, a group called Athlete Ally. So I'll speak to that. Um, as you can see here, disability is not in principle six right now, and so that's some work that's ongoing. Um, there's other dimensions of, of discrimination and areas of protection um, that you know, always need to be looked at and considered. And so it's really important to look at this charter, the Olympic Charter, as it re relates and interacts with the United Nations and this human rights conversation. So as we begin to kind of drill down into this conversation about athletes and, and how do athletes begin to engage and their role and their responsibility when it comes to human rights. There's this quote that has really stuck with me about athletes should play and not pontificate. Um, so it's really this question, should athletes only play and not speak out on human rights? And so we begin to examine that question. For me, I wanted to be able to introduce the notion of activism and advocacy here because I think it provides a, a, a really good lens into thinking about the role of an athlete and the role of sport in addressing human rights. Um, and also it begins to challenge that question of, well, what is the role of sport and how, to, and how do we see it? Do we see sport as just entertainment? Do we see athletes as just entertainers? Or do we see athletes and sport and recreation and play as having a, a broader purpose? And so this, this um, description of activism was actually, actually shared with me probably about 10 years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago. And it really had a profound effect on me in thinking about what does it mean as an athlete and athletes around the world to actually take part in human rights work. That human rights work is not only about the protests, it's not only about engaging in um, and rallies on the street, but there's many other kind of tactics and many other kinds of approaches for activism. That activism is more about the stance in the world, that activism is more about the possibilities and it's about the values of what we stand for. And so this definition here, again, it's a really great activity to think about, like what is, active, what is activism, what is advocacy, and how does it relate to sport? So even just a couple of days ago, I was, you know, thinking about what does it mean to be an advocate and how do we advocate and why, you know, how does advocacy, advocacy actually come about? You know, who, who helps us define ourselves and think about ourselves as, as advocates? And so I wrote this the other day, so I thought I would share it. Um, advocates can proactively mobilize and vocalize for change or can use role modeling in a subtle yet profound approach. Some advocates may be demanding and push for change, while others may pull for change simply by modeling through the lived example of their everyday lives. And so again, to be able to share this bit about activism and, advoc and advocates kind of as a prelude before we begin to think about the actual examples of athletes that are engaging in human rights work. Also, there has been, I was um, involved and have been involved with research in kind of looking at the role of athletes uh, as advocates and whether or not there is a connection between the athlete experience and the experience of being an advocate. So the question is brought, you know, are there dimensions of sport that potentially have implications for progressive and activist orientation? So things like social consciousness, meritocracy, responsible citizenship, interdependency. For me, one that I really link to is strategic and critical thinking. 
the ways that we think about our roles as an athlete on the playing field or how we're going to win or how we're going to do our best, um, what those kind of skills of being strategic and critical, those are the same types of thinking about how do we negotiate a situation, how do we advocate, how do we begin to address human rights. And so I think there's some really interesting connections between those skills as an athlete and those skills as an advocate for social change. And so again, can we make this case? Can we begin to think about the role that sport has, that it can have and it should have, to be a vehicle for progressive social change, human rights, peace work, development? So the one thing that I wanted to share and um, I wanted to kind of introduce this again right before getting into some of the examples of athletes is as we begin to look at the athletes and these examples that I share, um, one of the things that's really interesting is, is how do they come to the work that they're doing? How do they decide to engage on a particular human rights question or a particular human rights issue? And what inspired that? And, um, and kind of reflecting and working with athletes across the continuum of issues over the last 10 plus years, this, this, common theme of rights from wrong seems to appear, and um, I'd love to kind of dig into that a bit and, and get your thoughts as well. Um, but maybe this notion that there had to be a problem, there had to be a, um, a wrong that allowed the athletes to begin to think about approaching a human rights perspective, um, that there needed to be a situation. And so there's lots of work in the human rights world that's been done about rights from wrongs. Um, as human beings have recognized the wrongs of such institutions as slavery, genocide, and religious depression, they have constructed new rights to prevent the recurrence of old wrongs. And so as we begin to think at the sports landscape, I think it's really interesting to see, well, what does this bring about for sport? You know, as an experience of race, of gender, of disability, discrimination within the context of sport, does that begin to make us realize that we need to address this from a human rights perspective? And so I think that's where I wanted to be able to share that as kind of an insight to, the, to start this conversation. So I wanted to be able to share just a, a few examples of athletes over the years, some of them kind of iconic that may be more recognizable than others, to be able to just tell the story, to be able to share kind of the, the athletes as they've um, been inspired, especially the modern day athletes and thinking historically kind of who has inspired this movement of sport and human rights, of the notion of the right to play. And many will take it back to this moment, 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games, we're on the medal stand, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, um, you know, historically took the, the black power salute um, as they went to accept their their gold and also and their bronze medal. And at the time, historically, um, both civil rights and also human rights um, were, were very prominent. And so for these two athletes to be able to um, begin to address this. And so I wanted to call attention to two others as part of this equation. One is on the medal stand, Peter Norman, who took the silver medal. And very interestingly, he's, um, there's a patch on his left shoulder. All three of them have the, the patch, which says um, the Olympic Project for Human Rights. And so this is what they called themselves, particularly Thomas Smith and John Carlos. But as they were preparing to go onto the medal stand, Peter Norman, um, in solidarity and allyship, he joined forces um, and stood with them in solidarity for this kind of human rights protest. I also wanted to call attention to the picture on the right side of your screen, which is um, one of the athletes, uh, John Carlos, um, as well as a gentleman named uh, Harry Edwards or Professor Harry Edwards, who was the architect, the educator, the one um, behind the scenes working particularly with Tommy Smith and John Carlos. And so I think just from an educational perspective that that the story of these two athletes um, 
and really these three athletes with Peter Norman included and kind of how that journey took place. Um, Terry Edwards being a, a sociology and sport professor um, from uh, UC Berkeley. And so we're going to actually come to him again as we see uh, when we get to Colin Kaepernick you know, a little bit later. Um, so one, that's really the iconic historical um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Second athlete, um, actually yesterday, just was Muhammad Ali's, um, would have been his 75th um, birthday celebration. So there's a lot of messages being shared around the world and people speaking about his legacy and how he's sort of been a, a mentor to the world, a mentor to sport. Um, so he um, he really was had a had that kind of profound effect um, in many ways, and, and really he started this conversation. He helped to engage um, in a profound way using his platform as an athlete to raise these questions, to raise these human rights questions. And I was you know there's so many you know ways that Muhammad Ali contributed to the human rights conversation where he stood up as an advocate um, addressing, you know, most notably was Vietnam, you know, where he called attention to the fact that these problems in the United States and then what's happening, um, although what's happening around the world, what's happening here in the United States. So I think Muhammad Ali really just brings it, brings attention to, uh, to the fact that, um, an athlete can speak up, can have that profound effect, and can address human rights in, in a visible and um, profound way. I would um, wanted to be able to introduce another sort of iconic figure of, of sport and human rights, which would be Billie Jean King, um, particularly as we move from kind of race issues into gender, um, you know, the Title IX movement uh, at a civil rights level, but also really advocating for women in sport in a much more global um, stance. Billie Jean King, you know, established one of the first international, uh, national, but also international organizations that, that led the, the charge as it relates to women in sport, the Women's Sports Foundation, um, which still today um, serves as kind of a, a, a mouthpiece, an advocate for women in sport. They've had you know, many iconic women, uh, female athletes take the lead of the Women's Sports Foundation and, and really be that, um, that monitoring organization for women in sport. Um, and also they've contributed to um, human rights, whether it's in organizations such as FIFA or the International Olympic Committee or, or looking at grassroots development for women in sport. Billie Jean King is really um, such a pioneer for addressing the human rights landscape um, for women. And so I think it would have been remiss not to include her in sort of the iconic level of um, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, Muhammad Ali, and then Billie Jean King. So as we begin to shift, you know, to start looking at more um, modern day, more recent developments um, in terms of athletes taking on sport and human rights, um, and, and how it's evolving, how is it evolving um, to grow into a broader movement. Um, Johan Koss, a three-time Olympic speed skater, he, um, he, he donated his um, award winnings from the Olympics to create an organization initially called Olympic Aid and then turned into Right to Play. And so he also mobilized a global community of athletes, mostly Olympians, but, but many other athletes, to join him in recognizing the power that sport has, the responsibility of sport, uh, particularly to address children's rights and, and uh, the rights of children in, in refugee communities around the world, but also in, in any urban um, setting. And really any child having the right to play. And that, that really being the essence of the organization that Johan created. But he also um, began to expand the notion of sport and human rights to really um, embrace 
uh, a kind of a framework that has caught on within the international community, which embraces human rights, but it also looks at the connections to development and peace building within the international community and the role that sport has. And so this definition of sport for development and peace being the intentional use of sport, physical activity, and play to attain specific development objectives in low and middle income countries and disadvantaged communities in high income settings. So this notion of how is sport being used as a tool, as a vehicle, and what ways are athletes activating that? And so right now, in, globally, there's more than 5,000 organizations, um, you know, millions of people that are being affected by this notion of changing our framework of what sport is and seeing sport as its contributions for development and peace and, and then coming back to human rights, that it really is using this rights-based framework as a way to then elevate the development and peace conversation. So um, the organizations around the world, um, as they've begun to form and build more alliances within the United Nations movement, within the international community, um, one, of the, one of the strategies that evolved was to begin to think about how do we benchmark, how do we begin to look at successes, how do we begin to see sport for development and peace, sport and human rights, the power of sport as more of an um, ongoing conversation. And so there was an international working group that um, came together to look at this, the possibility of establishing an international day um, for this movement to rally behind. Um, it was really, I was able to be a part of that process. It was really amazing um, to contribute and, and help with the mobilization. Um, the day was actually established in uh, first in 2014. And so this coming April will be the fourth annual International Day of Sport for Development. Um, and it has been not only social media, not only um, rallying messages, but it has been a great way to benchmark with reports, with new introducing new policy, you know, highlighting um, more athletes that are involved in the space. It's really kind of been this uh, trickle effect to seeing kind of how are we growing, um, how is the media beginning to understand sport in this different way, beginning to realize that sport is more than just the dunks and the highlights on the field, but sport really has these um, really transformative effects in many other ways. So Johan and Right to Play had a role in kind of really helping to frame this conversation, but again, there's been many other stakeholders. You'll see organizations like um, Grassroots Soccer, which is HIV and soccer organization, Peace Players, which is um, peace building through basketball. Um, those are, you know, some of the, um, some ones that may be more familiar, but there's many organizations in all corners of, of, the, of the world that are now kind of taking this approach for having a rights-based lens, but also connecting it to development and peace. So I wanted to share a couple other um, athlete profiles. Again, athletes that connect not only to the human rights conversation, but also again to the peace and development work. I alluded to um, principle six earlier from the Olympic Charter, um, and there was an amazing athlete, Hudson Taylor, a collegiate um, wrestler, who used this approach of allyship, which I also touched on earlier, with regard to um, the 1968 games, but Hudson really um, mobilized this notion of what does it mean to be an ally and how do we leverage that. And he developed this campaign actually using the Olympic language, that principle six language of, of non-discrimination. But he recognized that his team recognized that that sexual orientation was missing from that. And so he um, rallied with his 
global network, um, especially around the Sochi Olympic Games in 2014, um, with the political context there, with the awareness of, of um, LGBT rights globally growing, um, the athlete ally community, this principle six campaign, triggered this movement to actually um, change principle six to um, adopt uh, the language of sexual orientation, and also within the bidding process for host cities to at least say in writing and hopefully in practice as it moves forward for uh, for LGBT sexual orientation to be addressed. Um, this campaign is really, um, in my work, um, particularly in disability rights, has really triggered an interesting conversation with Hudson and his team and others that Principle 6 is also missing disability. And so it raises these questions of, um, you know, how do we begin to think about disability into this conversation? So there are some high-profile athletes in the, in the world um, that are taking on disability inclusion. I would say that race and gender and sexual orientation have been more um, more prominent in the discourse, more prominent in the human rights um, arena. I mean, as you can see, 2016, uh, you know, to carry on 2016, uh, 2008 was when the Convention on the Rights for Disabilities was passed, so, you know, it's fairly recently. But one athlete that I wanted to share in the disability space who's really done quite a bit, um, both at a national level but also internationally for the rights of people with disabilities is uh, Tatiana McFadden, a very successful uh, marathon athlete and uh, track and field wheelchair athlete, uh, number one in the world right now, um, but also an outspoken advocate for the rights of people with disabilities. So she's really been using, utilizing her platform as a way to engage this conversation. Um, one of her, her main campaigns at a national level here in the United States was paralleling Title IX to address the gap of opportunities in schools, particularly high school, but also college, for students with disabilities. Um, but she's also even more so been a vocal advocate for marathons around the world, track and field events, to be sure that they're inclusive. And so really being uh, not shy, you know, but putting herself out there in the same way that many of the other advocates that came before her. So the final athlete, kind of as, as we begin to close here on some of my remarks, I wanted to share is really the recent um, you know, just in the last several months, last year, um, Black Lives Matter movement, um, giving voice to athletes through professional sport, um, really beginning to think about how, how do professional athletes begin to take on these messages. Um, you know, as, as we see um, within the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, um, and even in sport as a whole, you see kind of a trend toward athletes doing charitable work, but then the spectrum toward advocacy and social justice work, and kind of where do we begin to see that? And we saw Colin Kaepernick take his stand during the, um, during the national anthems, and you saw him, you know, take the knee, um, you saw him sitting, and then beginning to wonder, for me at least, kind of who, who was his teacher? You know, who was behind his work? Um, I saw him uh, rolling out a Know Your Rights campaign, saw him really beginning to engage in more of a human rights discourse toward not only sport itself, but also on the world. And uh, as I began to research and talk to my other colleagues, it turned out that Harry Edwards, the same teacher who worked with John Carlos and, uh, and Tommy Smith in 1968, um, has been an advisor for athlete development to uh, the San Francisco team. And so it was really interesting to kind of hear that kind of full circle and to recognize how um, 
professional athletes are now beginning to engage um, oftentimes with athletes at professional, collegiate, Olympic levels, there is a sense of isolation. There's a sense of, you know, play and not pontificate. And so, again, going back to that message and how do we begin to see that actually maybe this chance of addressing human rights can make athletes perform better or think better or be better. And so I think it's a really interesting conversation. Um, and it's really, you know, really interesting to see kind of where we're headed. So I think just in kind of a, some closing remarks, I, I think that this notion of the power of sport to inform, empower, and transform, you know, how are we beginning to shift our lens, beginning to see sport in this way, to see sport as not only elite sport, but recreation, physical activity, play, um, and how is it contributing to this type of education, to this type of awareness that that sport is actually important to the human rights conversation, that it's important to human development, to human rights, to peace building. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's a really a timely moment in our, you know, where we are right now with sport. And um, so it makes it really exciting and interesting, but also challenging because at the same time, there's a lot of forces, a lot of um, discourse on sport as entertainment. Sport is escape. And so how do we begin to think about, you know, sport in this way of human rights, of social justice? And so kind of a few questions just to share here. Kind of, I've touched on them a bit, but how can, we, how can we bring increased global awareness to the power of sport and the role of sport for human rights, development, and peace? How can we engage the world to see and understand sport for its contributions in ways other than entertainment and escape? And again, kind of ha this notion of an aha moment, I think sometimes that happens in really interesting ways, but how, how can we inspire aha moments so people realize they can take sport seriously for its value toward making the world a better place? And so I think that's really part of the essence of this conversation is like where are we headed how are we you know using our history and the lessons learned and and the fact that there's a lot of really um there's a lot of really great stories a lot of really great educational moments um and this notion of the teachers and the educators behind the scenes so i think it's it's a really um you know, I feel like in the work that I'm involved in on a day-to-day -day basis, there's always there's always a challenge, but I also see that again as kind of an opportunity. So. And then here in closing, wanted to share just a couple pictures from my uh, sports days um, here in middle school, and then me with the um, Paralympic Olympic team. We were down at the Pan American Games, and as you can see from the stadium, it was. <laughs> Very well attended, I guess, <laughs> maybe not so well attended. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I think it's just the way, for me, again, kind of how, how this kind of uh, beginnings for me, kind of how it inspired my interest in, in social justice. So, so thank you for this chance to share, and I'm really looking oh, forward to the Eli, conversation. Eli, thank you so much. That was a really powerful talk, and thank you um, gave us so many deep questions to think about. Those are really great um, discussion points you put up on the last couple of slides and really appreciated um, myself as a historian the way that you draw on the historical legacies for um, inspiration, the way you see athletes today looking to the, the past for that um, too, but there's so much else to talk about and it was um, such an active conversation that was going on in the chat box um, that so many great questions being raised. Um, I couldn't keep track of them all, but um, we are really eager to talk with you and um, we're going to bring Anne-Marie Gleason in in a moment, she's been monitoring the questions and um, kind of has curious, thought a little bit about where to get us started. And I think um, Anne Marie will take over for a bit now to um, to share some of the highlights of the, those questions with you. And Eli, if you want to try um, putting on your video button so we can see you while we're talking with you, that would be great. We'll see if that 
works. I think you're coming up. Yeah, yeah I'll go ahead and turn okay. the video on. Um, ooh, lots to talk about. Anne Marie, do you want to <coughs> have some favorite questions to start with? Sure, I will start, and I first just want to apologize if we don't get to everything or if you've noticed that I've tried to combine a few of the questions. There's been some really amazing conversation going on in the chat box, um, so I just have, just want to say hopefully I can do justice to all of your um, amazing and thoughtful responses. Um, so maybe just to, to start us off, Eli, there were some questions more generally about um, about sports and, and different sports in the sense of are there some sports that um, are more prone to or have had more activists um, in, the, in that sport in particular um, and is it seemingly to be are there um, athletes outside of the U.S. do they seem to be more or the same involved in terms of activism um, than, you, than American athletes? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question there. And um, I would say that the Olympic space, so some of the amateur sports, um, have been presenting uh, more opportunities um, for athletes to begin to engage and to take on some of these broader um, human rights uh, questions and challenges. Um, at the same time, there are, you know, limits and constraints from sponsors, from committees. Um, so sometimes athletes still don't necessarily feel they are um, either supported or, you know, even sometimes it comes from friends, family, uh, coaches. So um, I would say that the Olympic space there is. And then I would say in the last, you know, two to three years, there's really been an increase also, um, although more minimal and more um, kind of sporadic, but there is an increase at the professional level as well. Um, I would say that the, um, that particularly in basketball, basketball has actually had some leadership in the area of doing um, not just sort of the typical charity work, um, but more kind of engaged, more activist approaches um, and for the teams are supported, the athletes are supported. So I would say the um, NBA has sort of been um, a league that has definitely rallied more than I would say the NFL and Major League Baseball. Um, as far as um, internationally, you know, there are pockets of athletes that are, um, you know, engaging, um, you know, many kind of in the Europe regions, I would say, UK athletes, United Kingdom, athletes from England, Ireland, um, some German, you know, Norwegian athletes are involved. Um, but again, I would say many are more in the Olympic space. Um, within the FIFA soccer, global soccer system, again, there's, there's many athletes in soccer and many other sports that are doing what would be called charitable work. So they're, you know, maybe they have a foundation, maybe they're doing a charity on a particular cause, but on the spectrum of charity to human rights work, they're definitely, um, there's not as many that are, you know, taking on human rights questions or taking these kind of risks to their um, quote unquote identity or brand. Um, and so, it's really been interesting to be a part of some of these conversations about, um, you know, supporting athletes and their whole person and their whole identity and how that can affect how they could potentially perform. And maybe they actually, if you're a person, an, athlete, an elite athlete, but you have a passion for, you know, addressing human trafficking, as an example, or you have a passion for addressing inclusion and disability rights or women's rights, um, and you really want to stand up and speak out about it, you know, and that might actually make you feel safe and secure. So I think it's a really, there's some really interesting questions about the role of coaches, the role of administrators, and kind of how they begin to support athletes pursuing their whole person, their whole identities. So that's a, that's a little bit of a response to that question. Well, it brings up some great points. There's 
there's been some great uh, conversations around the responsibility for um, speaking out for inclusion and activism. Um, and some questions around from, from our uh, teacher participants that w what are your thoughts on where does the responsibility lie in terms of uh, making change, I guess? Would it be more at the international community, the government level, the sport itself, or individual, act of individual athletes? Like, so, um, so something more mm -hmm. along the lines of where, where does the responsibility lie? Yeah, that's also a really great question. I mean, I would, I think that it's really sort of multi-stakeholder, you know, multi, um, you know, engaging folks at all levels to bring awareness to sport and recreation and play as part of the human rights community, as part of the peace and development community to kind of normalize it so that there isn't this notion of play and not pontificate, that really there's a broader sense of embracing it. Um, and also recognizing this responsibility that there's this level of um, of athletes, um, you know, kind of where, where they're at, their ability to um, be engaged, their ability to have that platform. Um, you know, they're, they're interacting with young people, they're interacting with media, they're interacting with family, friends, and so forth. So, again, I mean, it's also about personal choice. So if there are athletes that are, that truly, you know, are, decide, you know, after doing their research, after being informed, after being supported in what they want to choose, if they still decide they don't want to partake at this time or, you know, that's not where they want to put their focus, then they need to also have that choice and that right. But if it's the athletes that do have this as part of their identity where they're being told not to, to just focus on basketball or just focus on soccer or, you know, just focus on winning that gold medal. And I think it's it's those athletes that are being shut out um, or shut down and being told what not to do. I think that's really where the challenge is. And so I think that's where the shift in perspective needs to come from the coaches, from, you know, peer athlete. You know, so it's a really a broader educational question and a um, really elevating this conversation about sports. That, And, again, it's really tricky because we're inundated with, you know, the ESPN and sports culture that reinforces just about the results, just about winning, and so I think, and just about your sponsors and commercialism. So I think it's, there is that tension, um, but again, it's how do we take, you know, global leaders and, and global mentors and global role models and, and being able to help change the paradigm um, to to bring sport and play into these conversations around human rights that it becomes more safe. I think part of it's just a sense of the athletes feeling safe that they're not going to lose their contracts. They're, you know, they're not going to um, lose their time plan. You know, that they're going to be embraced for their whole person. Thank you for that. I'm going to actually hone in on the part in the beginning when you were talking about international um, leaders or international organizations. And um, one of our questions is, do you, and I don't know if you can speak to this, but do you know how sport is being used to address the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Um, and if so, uh, how might it be being used? Yeah, no, that's, um, that's I touched on it a little bit in the kind of talking about sport for development, but yeah, to be able to expand a bit on that. Um, within the United Nations system, there is a small office, a small body that addresses sport for development and peace, but also within that is the human rights questions and the human rights advocacy. Um, there's also um, delegates or, or representatives within most of the UN system agencies that have a role with regard to sports and development, sports and human rights. Um, and so there is kind of a growing network. There's an international working group within the system that focusing on sport. Um, and then those, that network and that working group globally has been a part of the deliberations and the, the work being done on the sustainable development goals. And so there is a, um, there's a reference to sport and the role that sport has to contribute to the development goals within the the latest 
um, you know, 17 goals and the documents that relate to the sustainable development goals, but the sports piece is really, um, I mean, it's there, but I would say it's kind of buried. You know, it's, you kind of have to really dig for it to find it. So it's <laughs> not um, articulated in a way as um, kind of to the extent that I think it could really be highlighted as a contributor to the 17 um, and the agenda, the sustainable development goals and the whole agenda, um, you know, because it does have that ability to trigger, to affect, you know, it, um, you know, sport, you know, again, it has to be that intention, part of the way of sport being used toward development or human rights, it has to be intentional. You can't kind of leave sport on its own for it to kind of, ha for it to have the effects that you want, that we want. And so the ability to have, you know, the right stakeholders, the right practitioners, policymakers that are really there to help you know, um, navigate sport to be able to have the right lens to contribute. Um, and part of it is that educational process because most of the folks that are working on human rights work globally, they're, if they are introduced to sport in this conversation, it, it may take them um, some time to begin to recognize how sport can contribute to the sustainable development goals. And so um, that's why this global working group exists. That's why there's been you know, the stakeholders, that's part of the conversation about the International Day of Sport for Development. Um, this last year, you know, we really worked intentionally to connect the 17 um, goals to the International Day. And so we had a lot of messaging, a lot of storytelling, video, a lot of um, ways of trying to tell the story about how sport contributes to the Sustainable Development Goals. but Again, who's listening? Are we just talking to the converted? I mean, I think part of it is how do we begin to reach um, one of the activities actually that we initiated as part of International Day is a, um, it's very simple, but it's just a, it's a poster challenge. So, and this is really directed towards schools. So we really wanted, you know, schools and young pe children, whether you're in elementary school, middle school, even high school, to to share a poster, to share a, um, a drawing or a painting that would tell the story about sport and how it contributes to human rights and peace and development. And so that we've done that for the last couple of years. Um, one year we had like um, 500 contributions and another year we had I think about 300 or something. And so, um, you know, that, that was a really important activity. I think there's more that we can do, uh, more that can be done to teach and to translate this work into, um, and that's kind of excited why to be here, is to how do we begin to, you know, give these lessons in a way that can reach more people, um, especially young people. Um, I know there, there's been some talk about how do we develop more, you know, age-appropriate curriculums and and these kind of things, but I think now is the time for where we're headed with that. Great, and I'll just put in a little plug. If you don't know, if um, if you're listening and um, are not familiar with the Global Goals for Sustainable Development, that's the topic of our next session um, in the series in February, where we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, Dan had a question around the Olympics, and there were a few questions around, or people were uh, made comments about the the principles and around human rights. And so Dan's question is that he wonders where the aspect of human rights comes into play when realizing how the Olympics can help destroy the economies of the host countries. And and I would add that there are other issues involved with the Olympics and human rights as well. So is, uh, would you mind just sharing some of your thoughts, perhaps, about some of the tensions, I guess, around human rights in the Olympics? Yeah, no, that's really a really important question, and I think that's I tried to briefly kind of allude to that in terms of the, the educational pedagogy of the charter and of the Olympic movement. Um, it was actually his, the history of this founding of the modern Olympic Games was developed by an uh, international um, humanitarian educator, Pierre de Coubertin, who um, developed this um, 
human rights-based philosophy, what he calls Olympism. Um, so that gets a little bit more detail on that. So this Olympism is the is this philosophy of life about how do you live your life in a broad sense, how do you live um, not only on the field but off. So that there was this educational pedagogy that was at the founding of the of the modern Olympic movement. And uh, you know, part of it is that these principles, particularly principle four and principle six, are the ones that most um, closely speak to human rights. Um, at the same time, it is this tension, it is this kind of uh, oxymoron or hypocrisy about, you know, the commercialization of the games, the, you know, the notion of human rights abuses in countries where the games are being held. And so, you know, it's really interesting, and it's actually been one of the areas that I've, you know, explored and tried to study and I'm still studying, um, is, you know, how do we begin to look at human rights? Um, in terms of how do we con how does that contribute to the conversation? Um, you know, we have a lot of abuses. We have a, the modernization of the game, commercialism sponsors. But how can we at least have kind of a an athlete bill of rights or a, a charter on human rights that that can kind of be there for um, monitoring, for you know, for addressing the Olympic movement as a whole. Um, you know, because that kind of thing doesn't, I mean, there is the United Nations system, there's a partnership between the United Nations and the International Olympic Committee, but in terms of, you know, an, an actual a monitoring body for sport, you know, I've been in a few conversations around the world that have talked about, you know, we need a more of a human rights monitoring body. Um, there are a couple bodies, um, uh, organiz international organizations, there's the WADA, which is the body that monitors the anti-doping, so there's the doping monitoring, and then there's also a legal, there's um, the Court of Arbitrations of Sport. So that's more like technical as it relates to sport performance and um, legal issues that come up. But in terms of a human rights, um, you know, monitoring body, you know, a couple of the big ones, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, um, others, at the human rights level have had some conversations about monitoring sport, but, you know, it's, I think it it's an important area of work that needs to be done. Um, last year, I'm sorry, earlier this year, we had a, a summit, a virtual summit of um, international human rights and sport stakeholders um, where we began to talk about this kind of thing. Um, but again, it's a really interesting conversation in a sports context because, because there is this kind of, you know, we have this educational pedagogy, you know, here we are, we need to promote these core values, the fundamental principles, human rights, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of problems happening. And so, um, just in closing, I think it's, you, you kind of hit it on the head, that's a really core issue of, of work to be done. Well, while we're still talking about the Olympics, and I think right. this might have to be our last question, although I'll let Susan decide that. Um, but uh, Dad would like to know, Eli, uh, were you disappointed with NBC's recent Paralympic Games coverage? So around issues around the coverage of the Paralympic Games? Yeah, no, that's, a, you know, that's also a great question in terms of media coverage of athletes with disabilities, of more visible presence. Um, you know, yeah, I think that, that that's sort of been a core of my interest is how do we bring people with disabilities into the light, you know, creating more opportunity, more of a chance to be seen as athletes first. Um, and so there really has been this challenge of, um, you know, especially getting, making the case that there's going to be viewership, that there's going to be, um, you know, kind of the business side of media, but um, from a viewership standpoint, from all the young people, from all those that really want to see and embrace athletes with disabilities, um, you're just seeing that increase and increase. And so part of it has been kind of a, a journey, if you will, that um, the media are now beginning to see the potential of, of where. So there was an increase, you know, I mean, going from, you know, one hour, 
during the London games to 60 hours, you know, to from Rio. I mean, that's, and then if you look at the Olympic coverage, which is 2,500 hours, so it's a, it's a huge disparity, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's really important that the media is part of these conversations that what's their responsibility and how are they engaging to bring light um, to populations that are invisible. Um, so yeah, and I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's been great to see NBC starting to engage and starting to get involved and, but you're seeing other countries with coverage, you know, from Australia and the UK and, and you're seeing other countries kind of blowing out of the water with some of their coverage and more sophisticated coverage. And so I, um, just my hope that people with disabilities will just continue to become a visible part of our sports and play culture and that uh, it'll be sort of more seamless and then the media will also begin to, you know, showcase athletes and, you know, athletes with disabilities will be just a more um, common occurrence in our daily lives. You know, this was really a week when I think we all needed some inspiration and um, I want to thank you for that. It sounds like um, you have a, a sense of some hopefulness in, in that direction. So that's really wonderful to hear and I, I think, um, um, boy, your, your um, presentation tonight and the conversation we've just had speaks um, so much to the important intersectionality of all of these issues of changing notions of, of gender and transgender people and identities, disabil disability um, and, and, uh, and visibility for, for people who have um, in the past felt shunned or, or excluded. So um, it's really inspiring. It's a week when we needed to focus a little bit, I think, on, on how human we all are and, and, uh, and, and affirming the dignity of all. So thank you so much for that. Um, I want to take just a few minutes now to um, introduce a couple of our resources and um, tell you where you can find them so people can explore those further after the fact. And then at the end, Eli, we can bring you back on just if you want to share any last parting thoughts or um, anything that's come to mind as we've been talking. But um, so first, so that you all know, we have a brand new resource guide on sports and human rights, which is part of a suite of web resource guides that cover all the topics for our Global Social Justice Series for both 2016 and 2017. And there's the web link, um, the, the URL for that, um, for that guide. So I wanted to let you know that this guide is in no way meant to be comprehensive. And in fact, I'm already seeing from the great discussion we've had tonight and what we've learned from you, Eli, all sorts of other um, ways that this topic spins off in other directions and other resources that we want to add. So um, keep communicating with us um, teachers and, and participants tonight and let us know what else needs to go on that web guide. But it's a starting point and it um, really was um, quite a wonderful job that was um, curated for us by a, a terrific globally oriented classroom teacher from Connecticut named Deanne Moore who is one of the um, teacher partners with which um, we work so extensively and we thank Deanne for the great work that she did to create this resource. So um, here's what the page looks like when you um, go to it and I think probably Anne-Marie will um, be able to put the link there if you want to take a look at it live. Um, as I'm talking, but um, this is the, so there's a set of tabs. This was the, the first version last year, um, and then I think I have, this is a, not such a good picture of it, but this is the, um, the more expanded version this year, so you can see each of the tabs across the top of the page represents one of the um, webinars that we held and contains a selection of different um, classroom ready materials to um, take advantage of and make connections with this topic in the classroom. It's also a place where you will find the um, link, uh, uh, embedded link to the webinar so you can go back and reference it yourself and, and listen to it again or share it with others, with colleagues or students. 
one of the things that makes this topic of sports and um, human rights, sports and social change so exciting for teachers is certainly the high interest level it holds for students of all ages. Not all students are interested in sports, but many certainly are. Another attraction, I would argue, closely related are the many entry points that we can find for a discussion of sport and social issues across the curriculum and across grade levels and that, you know, we can think about everything from social studies and civics to anti-bullying curriculum to media studies to health and fitness classes to biology um, and anatomy so and so on and so forth. So it's an area where a little creativity can go a long way when we're thinking about um, teaching and classroom application. Well, one thing to think about is um, Eli already pushed us in this direction, but the International Day of Sport for Development and Peace, which is coming up on April 6th, and I didn't realize how very young that um, day is. It's one of the um, UN designated days um, to help us focus on important global issues. I, I I really love those and love knowing about them. But um, considering how new this day is um, on the international calendar, I think it's a great opportunity to get um, some of your budding um, communications and media st study students involved. So think about um, creating a, prom uh, a promotion and awareness campaign um, that students write and, and create. Um, I think Eli has made clear that the international community would love students and t um, teachers and student athletes and coaches to be more involved. So I have a link here to the, um, and, and you'll find it on the resource guide, to the UN um, site for this day. And there's some media packets there and some um, material that could be helpful if you want to get your students involved. Elementary and middle grade students can read um, biographies, memoirs, and nonfiction articles about groundbreaking sports heroes. Some of the iconic figures that Eli spoke about earlier, um, including Billie Jean King um, and Jim Thorpe, um, we can add to that list. They're fantastic figures to teach about. But it's also great, I would say, for young people to connect with stories of ordinary children, teachers and coaches, um, who are using sport and engaging in sport as a way of breaking down barriers and getting access um, to new opportunities and um, bridging gaps um, in societies. And the Right to Play website, which is linked, one of the links from our resource guide has some really nice material to do that. Uh, again, this is the organization, the NGO, that was founded by Olympic medalist Johan Koss, um, the speed skater, and that group uses sports and games to help children overcome effects of disease, poverty, and violent conflict. Those are their three areas in which they work. Um, and the website has these lovely case studies and stories with photographs and um, nice journalism, very accessible and readable stories about um, what teachers and students are doing around the globe um, sponsored by the, this um, Right to Play group to, um, to address those human rights and, and development issues. Young people, I think, um, I know are also fascinated as I was, I think as we all were, by the team of athletes that represented the worldwide community of international refugees in Rio last summer. That was such a powerful and moving story. Um, there are all kinds of articles that you could read and Zella at all, all different grade levels, reading levels, and that topic can open up so many important global studies topics. So global studies and um, and the right to play is a really um, prominent and, and great connection to make. For um, thinking about anti-bullying curriculum and social and emotional health curriculum, there are lots of opportunities there for um, linking up to this topic. A an organization that I'm sure you all know and love, and we do here as well at Primary Sources, Teaching Tolerance, and they have an excellent set of lessons on reducing gender stereotyping and homophobia in sports, a topic that we just um, barely got to talk about in all of the in incredibly important issues we were um, running through uh, this evening and it's kind of panoramic view that um, 
that Eli shared with us, but here's the lesson for elementary students, and there's another for middle class and high school, and I think it's quite good. So you'll find the link there um, to that topic on our resource guide. Teaching civics on the Constitution or U.S. history, you might consider a case study on gender equity and access to sports. That's something that Eli spoke about and spoke to. And if that's interesting to you, you'll like this well done lesson on the history of Title IX and the 1972 Education Amendments Act. It's also a very, very good um, new book on this topic on sports feminism and Billie Jean King um, that's really trying to put her into, um, into place as a central figure in um, U.S. feminism and international feminism. And um, on that uh, similar set of topics, I finally like to call your attention to this um, wonderful documentary film that we link um, to uh, uh, some supporting materials on the resource guide, not just a game. You may have heard of um, Dave Zirin and his book. This, um, this film was uh, made uh, based on um, Zirin's book. He's a journalist. And um, there's a very strong study guide that goes with it that you'll find. You'll find a trailer to the film and the study guide on our resource guide. There's lots of potential here using this film with students. It's incredibly engaging. And um, it really links, I think, very closely to what Eli was saying. Maybe, Eli, well, um, when you're closing out, you can um, um, say whether you like and are familiar with this film or have used it in your own um, teaching and awareness raising. But um, this, what you're seeing here on the slide, is a auditory review from the um, Zen Education Project, one of my favorite go-to websites for social movement history. So they endorse the film and, and recommend it, as do we. This slide is kind of a twofer for um, two good ideas for for um, for teaching in this area. So um, I hope that you will enjoy the resource guide. Feel free to share it with others. It, it's um, it meant, meant to be used, and we'll um, grow it and expand it as we get um, your suggestions in the future. Um, and again, that's the place where the um, recorded webinar from tonight will be linked as well. Uh, Anne-Marie or Eli, any final thoughts that you would like to share or um, comments that you would like to make as we're closing out this evening? Yeah, this is Eli. I just wanted to you know, say thank you so much. And um, yeah, really, that resource is wonderful that you prepared. Um, yeah, Dave Zirin and his Edge of Sports blog and all of his articles that he does is wonderful. Um, I've gotten to know him over the years. Um, Another person who's been one of my mentors is uh, Richard Lapchik, Dr. Richard Lapchik, who's done a lot of the formative work around sport and human rights. Um, so I, there's, there's some really great resources out there. So thank you for combining those. And, and thank you so much for the opportunity, again, for, to be a part of this. Some great questions. And happy my email is out there. And then I'm, I'm on Twitter, which is EliWolf10. So happy to connect on Twitter uh, or email. And I, I see some of the questions. And I'm happy to try to respond to as many of those you know, via email as I can. So um, again, thank you so much. It's a really wonderful opportunity. That's I, I so look forward nice. to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Eli. We do as well. We're really happy to have met you and, and look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks for all of your great um, contributions tonight. And um, here are some of the ways that you can connect with us. All of these are linked from our homepage, the primarysource.org website. Thank you, everyone, for your participation tonight. It was a great session. And we'll look forward to being in touch with all of you soon. Take good care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.